Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, we have show and tell tonight. Uh, please welcome our soloist tonight, Johannes Moser. Hi, good evening. So we're going to do something rather unusual since he brought, you know, his friend with him. Uh, we're going to talk about the cello concerto first of Shostakovich. The piece comes from 1959, written for perhaps the greatest cellist of the 20th century, if not probably ever, Mitzislav Rostropovich, who I guess is responsible for about 90% of all the great cello concertos in the 20th century. Uh, Shostakovich wrote not one but two cello concertos, this one, the first one in 59, and the next one in 66. So with that said, uh, from a cellist point of view, what are you up against? <laughs> A monster. <laughs> no, what is really um, fantastic about this piece is that it has a lot of emotional depth and a lot of, um, you know, uh, hurtfulness in his life that is that is sort of woven into that piece of music. But we were joking uh, during rehearsals, saying like it's really horrible to have such a good time when the subject is so uh, severe. But we are. We are having such a good time doing it. And, uh, the and with such a hard piece, too. We're supposed to be suffering through it. And <laughs> it's a little too easy, so <laughs> sorry. But the, the thing is that, that it, it has so, so much rhythm and, and uh, such, such a driving quality um, to it, th especially through, throughout the first and the last movement, that um, I think it's, it's engaging on so many levels and it's, it's contrasting beautiful with, with a slow movement that is incredibly emotional and then you have um, something that is very unusual. You have an incredibly long cadenza. The cadenza Which is a movement unto itself. Exactly, and it is because it's, it's so long. I mean, it's like four and a half, five minutes, something like that, depending on your mood and skills, I suppose. And um, yeah, it's, that is probably the most challenging part of the piece. How involved was Rostropovich with the composition, or he only got the music when Shostakovich finished it? Do you know? I think he got the music when, when he was finished, but I don't know for sure. Um, but I think he definitely inspired not only um, Shostakovich, but any composer um, to take the uh, composing to new heights and uh, to, to not think of the cello as sort of, you know, um, a, a, a double bass on, on speed, but, but just um, really as a virtuosic um, entity. And up until, uh, you know, up until Rostropovich came along maybe with, with Casals and Foreman, nobody really believed in that kind of instrument. Um, so Prokofiev was the first one to actually um, write sort of a turbo cello concerto uh, with a Sinfonia Concertante, and that sort of set the bar for all the um, composers to follow that you actually can write very demanding, technically demanding music for this instrument that, you know, before that was just sort of um, laying down the bass and was sort of an endearing, you know, mm -hmm. elephant. Well, nobody like the Russians, particularly Shostakovich and Prokofiev, for finding ways of making fun of authority. You really, when you hear this music, there is this constant underneath the water <laughs> that is so clear in this music. Remember that these were amongst the darkest and scariest times in the world. I mean, imagine growing up in the 20s, 30s, 40s in Stalin, Russia. You know, it's one thing to have to put up with uh, uh, Nazi Germany, but it's another thing that once you win that, you're now stuck with Stalin. So these, it's a part of the world that has suffered very much so through, through these very dark periods and composers and artists uh, had to be very careful where saying the wrong thing or writing the wrong thing would cost you your life. And this is what people like Shostakovich had to live with every day. And these people found ways of, again, under the water, always make fun of them. And nobody like the Russians could do it so subtly that everybody got the joke instead the people that were being made fun of. But isn't that always the case? And in this music, you hear a lot of that almost sarcastic, uh, uh, very funny uh, way of, 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 again, was something that is so human, making fun of authority. Mm. I, what is incredibly interesting to me is that, that Shostakovich, on the one hand, was a superstar uh, in the Composers' Union uh, on the one side, and with the other foot, he was, um, you know, almost every day um, there was a chance that he would be deported to Siberia. Mm -hmm. So this sort of, um, you know, always being torn into half, I think, tore him apart apparently, uh, at a certain point. And even to this day, there is great debate about whether he was an actual believer 
of the entire communist uh, ideal, or it was just basically a matter of convenience to stay out of trouble. To this day, that is being debated in many ways. Well, I think that is like people trying to simplify mm -hmm. a personality, because, I mean, you are not black or white. You're, right. you're not, not bad or, or good. You're not, uh, there, is, there, is, there is no, um, no true diversion of, of personality. I mean, everybody has tried to got, get by. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think in in Shostakovich's case, it's it's hard to to say. Well, you know, he was part of the system, or he was not. Mm -hmm. He was living there, and he was trying to make it, you know, day to day. So um, I think it's not really up to us to say, you know, was he was he one of the bad guys, one of the good mm -hmm. guys. Yeah. But um, what was interesting uh, for me was when I was in Moscow in 2002, I actually met the person that um, gave him such a hard time, who was actually in the composer's union at the time. Mm -hmm. Not a successful composer, but he was good at politics, mm -hmm. and um, he gave Shostakovich an incredibly hard time. He is still a part of the music scene there. So it's interesting how, how the personnel hasn't really changed. Um, and, and people are sort of fine with that. You know? What are you going to do, some uh, examples from the piece? I mean, why do you bring your cello along? <laughs> Just to lean on something. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. These are tough times. <laughs> Well, b before I, I demonstrate something, I just want to tell you real quick about this instrument. This is a um, Guarneri, Andrea Guarneri from 1694. Uh, so it's over 300 years old. So that's why it's a good idea not to drop it. And um, it's been made smaller at some point and then made bigger again. So it's been through a lot of um, plastic surgery. But, you know, as, as with Cher, they only get better with age, I suppose. And um, what I wanted to demonstrate for you tonight is um, these, these sort of undertones that we were talking about. Um, this piece was written in 1959, so Stalin had been dead for six years, uh, which meant that you could really, under, under the carpet, under the water, you could start making jokes. So um, uh, Stalin had a favorite song, which um, was called Suliko, which I'm going to play for you now, the beginning. Yes. <coughs> Singer-songwriter style, I hope you... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse my vibrato. Um, and that very beginning of the piece, he was mocking uh, in the concerto, and this is what it sounds like. So that very beginning, he was able to um, turn into yeah, an incredibly sarcastic notion. And not uh, even Rostropovich did not mm -hmm. decipher that. He was, he, was, uh, he was puzzled to the end what that really is, and then Shostakovich had to point it out. Um, so it was really a hidden code, if you want, but people who knew, knew. You know? So that, that's what's, what's um, incredibly interesting to me. Uh, something that is unusual in this concerto is the orchestration. It calls for a small orchestra, but it has... Uh, no brass except for one French horn, which at times becomes almost a co-soloist with you. At times, this one horn player basically has a you know duets, huge duets with with uh, with uh, the soloist, and then you have a huge timpani part, this very relentless timpani. And in an orchestra that has no brass, it's kind of weird to have just woodwinds, one French horn, and a timpani. You know, and that's that's about it. And then the rest are just woodwinds. So that's you know. The first violin concerto also calls for four horns, no trombones, no trumpets, and one tuba. So Shostakovich was known to kind of experiment a little bit with orchestration, but what makes it great about this particular orchestration is that it is easy for the cello to shine through. Sometimes composers go a little overboard with accompaniments where <laughs> it makes it impossible to hear the actual solos, but this is a piece that I think makes it easier, but it doesn't mean that the piece is not very aggressive. I mean, this piece is filled with so many notes very fast, uh, and it is a tour de force, both physically and technically, for the cellist, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's already demanding to do like a general rehearsal in the morning and then the performance in the evening. So I try to save a little bit of energy in the morning yeah. usually, and then then spend it all at um, at night. Um, you have to pace yourself a little bit um, with that, but of course, then when it's time for performance, there is no holding back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about like unusual techniques for the instruments? Are there anything that until then was deemed uh, unusual? Definitely. Um, he uses artificial harmonics at the very end of the slow movement, which I'm going to play for you. Mm -hmm. 
there's something so eerie about that. And Absolutely, yeah. and and what what that is 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 the the theme of the um, second movement. But now it's turned around. Um, so what was low before is high now. So so in a way, the world is upside down mm -hmm. for him. And he uses the same um, thing at the beginning of his piano trio. And so the cello is actually higher than the violin. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, again, that's a sign for the. the the world is out of control and, and things that are supposed to be low are high and s things that are high are supposed to be low. And in that particular moment, uh, in the second movement, which is the slow movement, um, is a conversation between the cello and then the violins are playing this constant eighth notes, just very quiet, very eerie. I always say it's, it's the Jaws effect, where you don't know what's under the water and you're usually more afraid of what you don't see, of what you see. And, and this music in Shostakovich is so scary at times and again I think it speaks a lot about what people were going through uh, during those years the 30s the 40s where you couldn't say things and a lot in this music there's a sense of almost of whispering you could not say it you had to go to the person next to you and just kind of you know to keep safe in many ways and there's a lot of this music that under the cello you hear these voices underneath that are just basically being very quiet and trying to express something uh, this music not only is incredibly expressive, but I can promise you, it is, there's a great sense of, of eeriness that, that only someone like Shostakovich can truly pull off. So with that said, everyone, thank you, Johannes, for joining us thank this you. evening. Thank you. See you in a, and, uh, in a little while. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to tell you that for me, this particular program is probably my favorite of the whole season. Um, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't know if I should have told you that. Every program is great for me. But this one is a program that um, came together in, by, by all different types, of, of, um, uh, all different types of, of, of circumstances. And this is a program that is, I will tell you this, a tough sell. These are all 20th century composers. There's, no, there's not one war horse in this program. And I can promise you our marketing department was probably nervous about it, and I don't blame them. But like a troubled child, that's the one you root for. And for those who braved uh, looking at a program that might not be your usual bread and butter, trust me, you're never going to forget this. Um, because the music that you're going to hear tonight has a deeper meaning than beyond the musical. Opening tonight uh, is a piece by Arnold Schoenberg, who many will blame as the guy that basically made new music sound like a scary idea. <laughs> Arnold Schoenberg, in 1911, 1910, around the time of Gustav Mahler, was writing what we consider to be Germanic post-romantic, Wagnerian music, luscious, you know, big. And then somewhere in the middle, he decided that he wanted to go a different direction and started experimenting with atonality. Thus, we got into the whole idea of atonal 20th century, sometimes mathematical music that melodies went out the windows, harmonies went out the windows, and people started composing music almost as formulas and not so much as actual pleasing sounds. Arnold Schoenberg um, made that trip beginning around 1915, but if you hear, hear early Schoenberg, it will sound to you like any Gustav Mahler symphony. It will sound to you almost like Wagner. The piece you're going to hear tonight is his last orchestral piece, it comes from 1948. He died in 1951, came to the United States. He was born uh, into Judaism, converted, to a, 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 a type of Lutheranism in 1898. And then when he moved to Berlin in 1933, converted back to Judaism. Not the best of times to do that. It's no surprise that five weeks after Hitler became chancellor in Germany, he came to the US for good and lived in California, relocated uh, to Los Angeles and taught at UCLA composition for many, many years. A Survivor from Warsaw is a piece for orchestra, narrator, and men's chorus. It's an unusual combination. And it is basically an homage to victims of the Holocaust. The piece was written five years after the end of the war. Remember that the horrors of not only the concentration camps, 
but also the horrors of what took place in Poland, in the Warsaw Ghetto, in 1943, is something that people started finding out two, three, four years after the war was over. There was no Facebook, there was no internet, so the news, people had heard rumors, but I think around 1948 it became obvious that there was something truly horrendous that took place in, in the world. And Schoenberg heard through friends and through uh, people that he, he got to know that had come to the United States, he had heard about these horrors and very quickly decided that he had to somehow pay homage to that historical time. So this piece came out of a commission from the Kusevitsky Foundation, Serge Kusevitsky, I've mentioned him many times, was the music director of the Boston Symphony. We owe him a great sense of gratitude because he basically commissioned all of the great 20th century composers that we now just think have been around forever. Without Kusevitsky, we would not know who Prokofiev, Ravel, Hindemith, and Stravinsky add the list of people because he was a man committed to new music. And I always say to you that I almost model myself on what we do here to what Kusevitsky did. We are creating the next great war horses of tomorrow. And you are part of that experiment, by the way. So the commission came about, and he knew from the beginning that he wanted to write this piece basically to pay homage. And the narrator would basically tell a first-hand account of what took place in the Warsaw Ghetto. And particularly, a moment where a bunch of men are being loaded onto trains right before they're being taken to concentration camps. And as they are being loaded, you hear not only the eyewitness account, but you also hear the voice of a German sergeant. And you're going to have these voices, basically, sometimes telling the story, and sometimes you're going to hear this very scary German soldier giving orders and threatening these people basically with murder and, and with their lives. And then at the very end of the piece, which I think is one of the most poignant moments in, in, in music for me, out of a sheer uh, sense of, of survival and, and out of just a sheer sense of, of spiritual awakened, uh, uh, awakening, the men start singing a Hebrew chant. As they are being loaded, there's something overtakes them and they start singing Shema Yisrael, which is a Hebrew chant that says, Hear Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And they start singing it in defiance in this very horrible moment. Why do we bring George Takei to narrate this piece? George Takei, of course, part of pop culture, and I will be the first one to admit, I'm a Trekkie. And we know him as Mr. Zulu. How many Trekkies are out there? Hey, you, you see, it's a pop culture thing. <laughs> but very few people know that as a child, in 1942, he was five years old, he and his family were put in Japanese internment camps after Pearl Harbor was bombed. Perhaps one of the darkest moments, I think, in American history. They were first brought to a horse stables in Santa Barbara while the camps were being built. And then about six months later, they were trained, sent by train to Arkansas, in the middle of nowhere, where they had set up these camps. And basically, they shared uh, this camp with about 18,000 other Japanese Americans uh, for about three years. And this is uh, among George's uh, earliest memories as a child. As he said it, for him, it was an adventure. As a child, his parents kept telling him, oh, we're going on vacation, we're going far away, and we're going to ride a train. For his parents, of course, it was anything but. For his parents, it was, it was a matter of, 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 of um, it was insulting, it was scary. Uh, they basically had no rights whatsoever, just based on how they looked, because they looked like the guys that bombed Pearl Harbor. And all over the United States, these camps were set up, and. Um, this is something that I know Mr. Takei is very, very close to. So I think given the relationship between uh, the survivor from Warsaw and what Mr. Takei went through at the same time here in the U.S., I think he's the perfect person for this, uh, to narrate this piece, because he brings something very personal to this idea. Then I came up with the idea, okay, you have to do this piece, but after this piece there has to be a moment of reflection, in my opinion. This is not a piece that you can play and then go home. So I came up with an idea that I actually had one night, I just woke up in the middle of the night. I, sometimes this happens to me. I have these bursts of creativity. And I woke up in the middle of the night saying, I found it. I got it. I know how I'm going to follow this 
very dramatic and scary piece, and how do I make it, um, how do I finish it? And I came up with Charles Ives. <laughs> Charles Ives is as experimental and as bizarre at times as you can think of. You remember our Universe Symphony last year with the five conductors and the insanity? Yeah, okay. But Charles Ives has perhaps one of the great works in the 20th century, which is a piece called The Unanswered Question. I am a big, uh, I love history, as you've told, you can tell from my lectures in the past. But World War II has always been a special interest to me, particularly what the horrors that took place in that 15 year period. Uh, to me it's just incredible that this happened in the world, that humans could find that level of hatred and that level of, 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 of evilness. So the unanswered question is almost like, why? And Charles Ives wrote this piece basically, again, as an idea of the perennial question of existence. And the piece is perfect because it is orchestrated for string orchestra or string quartet. Actually, Mr. Ives is very laissez-faire about his demand. He's like, oh, you can use four people or ten, I don't care. So we're using a full string orchestra which plays sustained, very, very quiet notes, which Mr. Ives said represent the silence of the Druids. Then he also calls for a trumpet to be off stage, and I won't tell you where he's going to be, but he's not going to be on stage. And the trumpet is going to ask the question, that perennial question of why we're here, where we're going, what does it all mean? As this happens, there is a quartet of flutes in the orchestra, with another conductor, by the way. She's going to be ignoring me, and if we sound together, we're wrong. So the strings, I'm going to be in charge of the strings. We have the silence of the druids. The trumpet asks the question, and the flutes and try to answer it. There are seven questions. The question is asked seven times. And with each answer, the flutes become more and more restless. The flutes become more and more frustrated. Have you ever had that moment when your child comes and asks you something, where do babies come from? And then you kind of try to steer them away and then they keep asking and they keep asking and they keep asking and then finally you turn on the TV or do something else to stay away from it. This is kind of like that. You're gonna hear the flute start very slowly and it's like, oh, well, maybe, and then they ask, well, what about? And then it continues on this until finally, literally the flutes just lose it. By the end, they play so loud that the sound becomes shrill and it becomes ugly. And in frustration, of course, it's, an, it's a question that cannot be answered. And perhaps it should not be answered. So the idea of having these two pieces being played back to back, one written in 1948 and one written in 1906, in the case of the Ives, I think they are perfectly paired together from a thematical point of view. Because this is an evening where, from your point of view, you're going to have a lot of reflection. And that's what I am hoping that in the end, you're going to have that moment within you. It's a very personal moment where, uh, as I said, you're never going to forget it. And with the power of music, uh, it is truly something that, that, that we can all share as a community. And isn't that what music should be? It should give us comfort, and sometimes it should also give us a sense of, of, of uh, reflection. The second half of the program is a piece called Harmonialaria, which was written by John Adams, perhaps the most successful, recognized American composer, living composer, by the way. John Adams uh, has the distinction of being the most performed classical uh, composer in the world. But at some point, at every minute, there's a piece of John's being played somewhere. Harmony Lehrer is was written in 1985 for the San Francisco Symphony, where he was composer in residence. And this is perhaps the largest and the longest of his orchestral pieces in a list of, of big, huge works, this is probably one of the most ambitious. John Adams started his career as a minimalist, which the term minimalist comes from minimal, where people like Steve Reich, Philip Glass would grab just small amounts of material and just repeat it over and over and over. It happens particularly with art, but we borrowed it with music and it works very, very well. The thing about John is that he is not a, he's not a pure minimalist like Philip Glass, for example, who grabs something and, my God, he doesn't let it go. Philip, John combines 
what I think not only the ideas of minimalism, but then also adds a lot of Germanic uh, romantic writing. His music at times sounds like Philip Glass combined with Gustav Mahler. And I think that's what has made him successful, because he's not one of these purists that just writes, as I said before, like Schoenberg, based on a formula. He writes music that has at least a sense of, of uh, uh, structure in many ways. Harmonie Lere, which can be translated loosely into book on harmony or treatise on harmony, that is the translation into English, is also actually the title of a book that Arnold Schoenberg wrote in 1911, the year that Gustav Mahler died, right before he went into the dark side. He wrote this book basically exploring the meaning of harmonies and also questioning why should we follow rules written during Bach's time. Aren't we in the 20th century? Shouldn't we, be, shouldn't we be questioning that? So you see the connection of why Schoenberg and John Adams share tonight's program. The piece of John Adams, trust me, you're never going to forget it. It is a tour de force, not only from an oral, but from a visual point of view. The size of the orchestra and the amount of material being played is going to blow your mind. This is a piece filled with color, with sound, with notes, with melodies. It is in the 30 years since the piece was written, almost 40 years since the piece was written, it, is, it remains, sorry, 30 years, it remains one of the great tone poems in American music. And I have championed this piece for many years. I have done a lot of John Adams music, but this one for me is one of my favorites. The piece is divided into three movements. Part one, no title. But we know from John that the first um, opening of the piece, which again, I'm not going to give it away, you're never going to forget. There are openings in music that are incredible. Mahler one, Beethoven five, John Adams harmoniolary. Part one came to him in a dream where he saw a tanker in this dream take off from the San Francisco Bay like a Saturn rocket and shot to the sky. That gives you an idea of what you're up against. And then the piece becomes this signature John Adams, repetitiveness but with a lot of melody and color. Part two has the title The Amfortas Wound. And for those of you who like our Arthurian legend, King Amfortas was also known as the Fisher King. He is the last one in the line of kings that was in charge of protecting the Holy Grail. There are versions of it, there's a Celtic version, there's a British version, there are German versions of the Arthurian legends. But in this case, the unfortunate wound has to do with the sickness of the soul, which back then was depression, and it was not curable, or was very difficult to be treated. Also, there are stories of King Amfortas being wounded in battle. Depending on which version you hear, he was either hurt on the leg or in his groin. And in either case, it has to do with a disease, and again, the sickness of the soul, which deals with something that his, his depression carried over into his kingdom, and basically it affected everything around it, particularly the fertility of the land, and made it turn into a desert. And then finally, the last movement, part three, is called Meister Eckhart and Quacky. From King Angfortas to Quacky. This is a very personal movement for Mr. Adams. Uh, this also came to him in a dream, and I joked with him the last time I saw John, I said, what were you drinking back then? Because man, <laughs> you were dreaming a lot. Meister Eckhart, for those of you who like uh, German philosophy, Meister Eckhart was a German philosopher from the late 13th into the 14th century. He's actually considered to be the creator of German mysticism, and in this dream, <laughs> John imagined Meister Eckhart coming to his house in a cloud and going to his daughter's bedroom. And his daughter Emily, John Adams' daughter Emily, had just been born around the time of this piece, and they had called her Quacky. They have given her the nickname Quacky. And in this dream, Meister Eckhart comes and picks up Quacky and takes her away on a trip throughout all of the great cathedrals in Europe and all of the great museums in Europe. And as Meister Eckhart is rocking her while she sleeps and showing her the beauties of Europe and the beauties of the cathedrals and art, he is whispering to her ear and sharing with her the secrets of the universe. 
I think this is a program you're never going to forget. I thank you personally for coming and, in, and, and, and supporting this program that I know is going to be a once-in-a-lifetime event. Thank you very much. Enjoy the concert.